Hi everyone, this is the um, second part of the homework seven solutions. This part covers chapter 12. Um, and in chapter 12, basically it's all equilibrium and something called elasticity. We went over this in lecture, but the equations that we need to know um, are essentially only a few. Um, the idea in equilibrium is that when something's in equilibrium, it's not moving in any way. So it's not rotating, it's not translating. And we say that the sum of the forces in X will be equal to zero. The sum of the forces in Y will be equal to zero. And the sum of the torques about any axis through the system will be zero. Um, that's important. We'll get to that. We'll talk about that and why we need that. But basically, we'll have two or three equations that we can use to solve for our unknowns. Elasticity, we're only going to use tension and compression, which is the force over the cross-sectional area is equal to Young's modulus times the change in length over L. Um, and that's it. We do need to remember that our torques if we choose some axis and we have, say, at some R, a force acting, um, we can put them tail to tail. And we can say that F and R, we turn R to F. In this case, it would be a negative torque. If F were instead upward, we would get R and F tail to tail. And we get a positive counterclockwise torque. That's all we really essentially need, assuming we know what forces are. Um, in general, the algorithm is draw your forces, draw your torques, set them equal to zero in X and Y, and set the torques equal to zero about whatever axis you choose, and then solve. Um, and so we're going to go through six problems and talk about how to solve them. So the first thing is this interactive problem. And in this interactive problem, they're giving us a diagram of a block on a beam. The beam is suspended by a wire at 30 degrees. And if you move this slider around, you can see the tension in this wire. Okay. And I'm going to put this back to zero. So if we have this, if we draw this, okay, I'm gonna draw the forces on this. So we have a, a wire at 30 degrees and we have forces here. We always have a weight of the beam, which I'm gonna call MB times G. If this block is somewhere, we have a weight of the block, which I'm just gonna call MAG. Here, we have a tension in the, x direction, positive x, and a tension in the y. And note that these are in the negative y hat direction, this is in the positive y. And in here, we're told that we have a force on the hinge in the y, and a force on the hinge in the x. So these are our torque diagram, or our force diagrams. Remember that this will be t cos of our angle, and this will be t sine of our angle for the tension. And now the first thing they want us to find is they want us to find M of the beam when this block is over here. And we can do that using torques. We could try to use the forces, but when we do the forces, let's just do the force in the X, for instance, we get that F of X, which is negative, plus T cos theta is equal to zero, or T cos theta is equal to f of x. And we could solve for that f of x. Um, to try and find this mass, we would use the mass of a times g plus, sorry, let me do this actually a little bit differently. Zero is equal to the force in the y, which is positive, plus t sine theta, which is positive, minus mbg minus mag. So these are all the forces in the Y, right? So the sum of the forces in the Y. And we already did the sum of the forces in the X. 
but we don't know MB or MA. We have no idea what they are. We don't know what FY is. So this doesn't help. We literally can't solve this. What are we supposed to do? When we do the torque, imagine instead, and let me do this on a different diagram. Um, imagine instead that the block MA, or I mean the block MB, MA is still here, right? At this axis, we're assuming this block is over this hinge point, right? There would be a force, MVG, there would be a force, FX, and there would be a force, FY. But this is a torque. And then here we would have a tension in the Y and a tension in the X. Now doing the torques here, if our axis is here, then all three of these forces are on the axis. Their R is zero. And remember that the torque is R, F, sine of the angle between R and F. Well, there's no angle here, there's no R here. So those disappear. And what we're really left with is about that axis at a distance L to the half. The weight of the beam is always in the half, as always at the halfway point of a uniform rod, we have MAG. And then at a distance L, we have the tension in the Y, and we have the tension in the X. But the angle between the tension in the X and L is zero. So this does not contribute any torques. If we look at this, we get L to the half and MAG. This is a negative torque. L and tension in the Y. Um, if I draw them tail to tail, this is a positive torque. Counterclockwise rotation is positive. You're rotating the R vector to the force vector. The R vector to the force vector clockwise is negative. And we get that the sum of the torques is zero, is L times TY minus L to the half times MAG. And we want to solve this for MA. So if I move this over, I see that I get L times TY, which is T sine of the angle, is equal to L to the half MAG, or multiply three by two over L, multiply three by one over G, and I get that MA is two T sine theta over G. But theta is 30 degrees, and sine of 30 is 1 half. So this is really T over G. And if I take that T, I can see in my simulation that when the little mass is at zero, the tension in that wire is 1960. Divide that by 9.81, and I get 199.7, or 200 kilograms. Okay. This would be kilogram meters per second squared, newtons over meters per second squared. So the answer will be in kilograms. It'll be 200. We can see that that is exactly what the answer is. Now, we're told we need to move the mass to anywhere um, and find the mass of the little block. What I'm going to do is I'm actually gonna move this to where x over l is equal to a half. The reason why I'm doing that is if x over l is equal to one half, then I know that x is equal to l to the half. Now, going back to a torque diagram, and now I have my mb, and I might have called it ma, nope, I called it mb, mb. I still have my weight ma g, Wherever my MB is, I have MBG. And I still have my tension in the Y. I'm leaving off the tension in the X. So my torques are now L to the half over MAG. X, which I'm also using as L to the half, over MBG. And full L times 
ty, which is t sine theta. And again, we know that this is a positive torque, this is a negative, this is a negative, right? So the sum of my torques is L ty sine or t, I really should have called t sine theta, minus L to the half mag minus L to the half mbg. And that's equal to zero. And I want to solve for this mb. So I can move that over and I get L to the half mbg is equal to um, Lt sine theta minus L to the half mag. If I multiply through by two over L and divide by G, sorry, MB is one half T sine theta, two over L is MAG. I'm multiplying through by two over L. Um, and that means that I've done this wrong. Um, two, and I'm dividing through by G. Now, when I do this, I can plug these in because I know this is 200. I know that this is 2695 and this is 30. If you look here, this is the tension when the block is there. And what I get is two times 2695 times sine of 30 minus 200 times 9.81, which is 733 divided by 9.81, and I get 74.7 .7 or 75 kilograms, essentially. Okay, and that is our answer. All we had to do was add another torque due to where this block was. And X didn't have to be L to the half. I chose it to be that just so that I could figure it out easier. This could have just been X. And then I could have solved for um, X using that X over L is equal to whatever it happened to be. I chose it to make it easier. Question three is what is the magnitude of the horizontal force of the pin? So what they're asking us for is they're asking us for what I called F of Y. And if you go back to here and we look F of Y and we look at our equations, I'm gonna actually, I'm sorry, they're asking us for F of X. If I look at my equations back here, I can see that in the x direction, I have f of x and I have t cos theta. So zero is equal to t cos theta minus f of x. It's minus because it was going to the left. I didn't explicitly state it, but I'm taking y and x to be the normal y and x positive directions that we always use. Therefore, my f of x is t cos theta, right? When x is equal to L, I can move this so that x over L is equal to 1. That means that x is equal to L. I see that the tension is 3430. So this is 3430 cos of 30. And that, easy enough to do, that's 2970. Let's make sure that I got the right answer, 2970. And then finally, what is f of y when x is l? And going back to our torque equation, I don't know why you're doing that. Let me just put it here for a second. All right. I don't know what you just did. All right, sorry. Um, okay, so going back to our torque equation, if we want to solve for f of y here, we know that f of y is equal to mbg plus mba mag minus t sine theta. You can plug in those numbers, noting that t from here is 3430 sine of 30, um, you know that MB was 75, MA is 200, G is 9.81.
if you do that, um, 275 times 921 minus 3430 times a half is 982. And that's 980 is what they rounded it to. So the big takeaway here is that you can use the force and the torque diagrams separately or together to solve for what you need. Um, you're usually um, going to have to substitute either the torque into the force or the force into the torque to solve for what you want. The other thing to take away from this is that you choose an axis when you do the torque equation that gets rid of any unknowns you don't know and don't want to know and can't possibly find out. Because if we couldn't choose an axis, right, an axis that allowed us to get rid of these, we would have no way of solving this equation. We have too many unknowns, right? So that's essentially the reason why I assigned this was it's what we're doing over and over and over again in these equilibrium problems. We're just finding the sum of the forces in X and Y and the sum of the torques about one or more axes. And from there, we're done. So let's look at how this works for a couple of problems. Um, this is exactly what they just did in the simulation, except now the tension is going the opposite direction. And what that means for us is that our tension means that we now have here an f of x and an f of y at the hinge. We have here a tension in the y and a tension in the x. We still have the weight of our bar, which I'm going to call ma times g. And wherever this mb is, we have a force that's mbg, okay? So those are our forces. Here's our hinge point. And we're told the length of the bar is 2.5 meters. We're told the weight, mag and mbg, those are the weights, right? Weight of A and weight of B are 230 and 290. And finally, we're told that this tension can be a maximum of 450 newtons. Okay. We're also told the angle um, that this is at. So since the tension is T sine theta and this tension is T cos theta, we're given that theta is 43 degrees. So now, the first thing we want to know is what is the maximum distance we can place this bar at or this block at without anything breaking and if we go back to our torque diagram putting this here again just like we did before although tx is now facing the opposite direction we have the weight of a and then wherever we put the block we have the weight of b this is going to be l to the half this is going to be x going from this axis point. So from the left to the right. The torques here will be L to the half times MA, or I'm sorry, weight A. X times weight B. There's no torque due to that tension because the R and the force vector are parallel to each other. So we have L times T Y. We can see this is a negative, this is a negative, and this is a positive, right? If we turn the R vector to the force vector, summing these torques, we get zero is L times T Y, and I'm gonna put T sine of the angle, minus L to the half times weight A, minus x times weight b. Solving this for x, I can move that over and I get lt sine theta minus l to the half weight a divided by weight b. Now let's put that in and see what we get. We know that l is 2.5. So 2.5 times the tension 
the maximum tension of 450 times sine of 43 degrees minus 2.5 times 0.5 times weight of A, weight of the beam, which was 230. Divide that by the weight of the block, 290, and I get 1.6543 meters. The only thing that you need to watch out for is what if they had told us to take it from the right side? And if we did that, we would just take 2.5 and subtract it from, subtract our answer from that, and it would be negative 8.4, negative 84 centimeters from right to left. That's not a big deal though. That's just where you choose your origin. Um, even if you do that, you can still set your axis to be at negative 2.5 if you want. It doesn't really matter. Um, I would just do it like this because it's most convenient. Um, now with that being true, if this is true, how do we find the force on the hinge horizontally and vertically? And coming back here, we see that the force in the Y, or the force in the X I should start with, the force in the X will be equal to zero FX minus TX. Or again, FX is T cos theta. We know this is 450, the maximum cos of 43. I'll let you put that in if you want. Well, let me just to verify that I've done it right. I get 329. For the f of y, you see that the sum of the forces in y is zero is fy plus ty minus mag minus mbg. And if I solve that for fy, I get that fy is equal to the weight of a plus the weight of b minus the tension in y, which is t sine theta. And I know this is 450, I know this is what, 230 and 290. So 230, 290, and this is 43. So 230 plus 290 minus 450 sine of 43, I get 213.1 for F of Y. So in general, that's how these problems go. You'll use the torque to find some information and then put that back to find different forces wherever you need them. Pay attention to the scaffold problem and the ladder problem that I gave you. Uh, the ladder problem is in your book. We're going to do it next um, and then we're going to do a scaffold problem. So we're going to do the, the two types of problems really right now. So this is exactly like the ladder problem and why that is is if this were a ladder with some weight on it, it would be the ladder problem. The only issue on this problem that you really might have a problem with when you do your homework is if we look at this, we have essentially treat this person as a beam, right? So it's got at the center, it has some weight um, I don't remember if it gave us, it doesn't give us this weight, um, which is mg. And that's at a distance d up here. But they tell us what a is and they tell us what l is, the full length, right? d is from the ground to where is center mass is. So if we wanted to know this angle, if we have a right triangle that we know l and we know a, how do we find the angle? Well, we find the angle from cosine. So ka toa is adjacent over hypotenuse. So the angle is arc cosine of A over L. They gave us A and they gave us L. Um, the arc cosine in my problem is 0.93 divided by 1.95. That's 61.515 degrees. Other than that, let's get to solving the actual problem here. And the actual problem is, 
that we have friction on the ground. So at this point, we need to draw the forces and make sure you understand these forces. Since he's touching the wall, there is an N in the X direction. And since he's touching the floor, there is an N in the Y. At D, up that, there is his weight, Mg. This wall is frictionless. There are no other forces at this point because there's no friction on this wall. This down here, there is friction. And that friction has to be facing that direction so that he doesn't slide, okay? This problem's really about lever arms. And what we wanna know is what is the coefficient of static friction on his feet. So, sum in the F of X, sum in the F of Y, and the torques. Let's do each of these separately. In the X, I know I have NX minus force of friction is zero. Now the force of friction will be mu N. What is his N? Well, if I look, there's a normal force and MG, and therefore N is MG. We already know that though. We know that from right here. This is zero and this is N of Y minus MG. So this is really the normal force in the Y, right? Um, so we have this equation. And then finally, the torques. Now, what's the first thing you need to decide before you do any torques? The first thing you need to decide is what axis of rotation you're going to take. We're going to use right here to get rid of all that stuff. So if we're here and we're along this distance, we have mg and we have normal x. Now, in order to get the force or the torque here, we need R and Mg. But what is R? What is our R? Our distance from the axis to where that force is applied. Well, if this is D and we know this angle, then we know that R is D cos theta, okay? And we were told D was 0.97, we found the angle was 65.61.515 degrees. Um, so we can find R for that one. This torque is going to be, if we turn R to Mg, this is going to be positive. Now from the axis to N, we have to find this Y distance this R of Y. And you know that you're not trying to find this R of X distance for N of X because that torque would be zero. They would be anti-parallel. So this has to be R and N X. We know this whole distance is L. So R is L um, sine of our angle. And we know what L is. L is 1.95. And again, sine is um, 61.515. All right, and this torque is negative. When we turn R to N, it's clockwise, so it's negative. The sum of our torques is therefore zero, and it's equal to MGD cos theta minus, and this normal force, this is and x times l sine of theta, okay? And we need to solve this for nx. So how do we do that? Well, it's set equal to zero, so we get that nx is equal to mgd cos, cos theta divided by whatever's in front of this, l sine theta, or MGD over L times cotan of the angle, or one over tangent of the angle, whichever way you want to write that. Um, let's write it this way. MGD over L tan theta. That is N of X. Okay, but we need to find mu, right? So how do we find mu? Let's go back and look at this. So we know that nx is equal to mu ny. And we know that ny is equal to mg. 
So mu is equal to nx over ny. And if we go back and look at what we got for nx, what we got was mgd over l tan, mgd over l tan theta, and we're dividing that by mg. Get rid of these, and we see that mu is equal to d over l tan theta. d over l tan theta. And that is equal to, in our case, um, we're told that d was 0 0.97, l was 1.95, and this is tan of 61.515 degrees. And what I get, just to make sure that my answer is right, 0 0.97 divided by 1.95 tan of 61.515, I get 0 0.269917. So somewhere rounding, but 2699, um, which is fun. So you can see in this, the little wrinkle that you had to figure out here was the angle. And then you had to make sure that you had your lever arms correct, meaning your R is correct for these torques about this axis, right? Um, you could have chose to put it here. You could have chose to put it here. You could have chose to put the axis of rotation anywhere on his body that you wanted to. However, it made it easier to find an X, which is why we did that. Okay. All right. So the last equilibrium problem, the final two are actually um, elasticity problems. This last problem is some paint cans. And the main point here is going to be that these paint cans we're gonna treat as if they are a single block at the center of mass of the paint cans. And we need to find out where the center of mass of these paint cans are. So knowing that, we look at this system and we have a tension on the left, we have a tension on the right, we have M of the beam, and then we have wherever the center of mass of the paint cans are, G. And those are the only forces. This is a scaffold problem, okay? And we're told the length of the beam. We're told the uniform mass, MB. We're told that it has a bunch of paint cans that have a mass. So MP is 70.8 kilograms. M of the beam is 53.7 kilograms. This whole distance we'll get to is 2.57 meters. And we know the tension in the cable on the right is 767 newtons. How far horizontally from that cable? So it's telling us that we're going to say this is our origin. So how far from that cable is the center mass of the paint cans? Now, <coughs> here's a trick though. Okay, when we do these torques, we don't know TL, we don't need TL, we can find it. So we could do this one of two ways. We could set the forces in the Y equal to zero. And what we would have is we'd have TL plus TR minus MBG minus MPG. And we could solve that and get TL if you want. Or we could go faster, um, and so if we did that, we would see that TL would be MBG plus MPG minus TR. And I can do that really fast. Add the two paint cans, multiply them by G. So that'd be 124.5 times 9.81 and subtract 767. And I get that TL is 454 newtons. But I don't have to solve for it. Um, if I do that, I can set my axis anywhere I want. If I don't do that, though, let's instead set our axis right where TL is. Therefore, we don't have to worry about the tension on the left. So the tension on the right, MBG, MPG, uh, MPG, 
this guy is going to be L to the half, this one will be at X, and this one will be at L. So our torques are L and TR, and that is a positive torque, X and M paint cans, that is a negative torque, and L to the half, and beam G, and that is a negative torque. So let's set our torque equation, which tells us that L times TR minus X times MPG minus L to the half times MBG. Solving this for X, we get LTR minus L to the half MBG over X. Now, when we do this, uh, I'm sorry, not over X. Um, over um, MPG. When we do this, we know our length is 2.57 times TR, which was 767, minus 2.57 times 0.5 times um, the mass of our beam, which is 53.7 times 9.81. Divide that whole thing by the mass of our paint cans, times 9.81, and I get 1.86 meters. But what is this being measured from? It's being measured from my axis. And what they wanted was, they wanted from the right though. So I know that X from here is 1.86 meters. What is X from here? Well, the whole beam is 257. So 257, 2.57, I mean, um, minus 1.86 will give me the length from the right, which is 0 0.71 for me. I, there's rounding. Like I said, I don't know what Wiley uses for 9.8 or 9.81, and it seems to change um, depending on the problem sometimes. So we're around. Um, 0.71, which is fine. Okay. Um, I guess you should probably use 9.8. Let's use 9.8 in this equation. I will get 2.57 times 767 minus 2.57 times 0.5 times 53.7 times 9.8. Divide that by 70.8 times 9.8 and 2.57 minus this answer. So I think that they're using 9.8 for gravity. Just know that's the case. Um, the last two problems that we're about to do are problems involving elasticity. And as a reminder, force over area is equal to something called Young's modulus times the change in length over the length. This area, so if we have a wire, let's say, it has a cross-sectional area. If you're pulling on it with some force, A is pi r squared. If it were a square, it would be length times width. Okay, that is the A. That gives you, if you solve it for a length change, A over E is the length change, okay? And this length is the total length of the wire or the object or whatever we're talking about. E is a constant given in a table. So it's usually given to you in the problems. We're going to do some kind of fun things with this. Not fun, but hard. Um, in this first problem, you have this huge volume of mass, right? You're gonna have this some big old volume, and it's going to be held up by these steel beams. Okay, and what we want to know is how many of them do we need? And to do that, we're gonna to need to find the weight that's on them. So, first of all, what is the weight? What is the mass of this? Well, we know that the density is m over v, therefore, um, 
m is density times v. And v for this is the length times the height times the depth, okay, or width. It's a block, right? So just multiply those three numbers, 200, 7, and 8.9. 200 times 7 times 8.9, and I get 12,460 meters cubed. Now the density that we're told, right, that the tunnel is supported by these beams with the cross-section of the mass of the material and the ground material. What is the total weight of the material that they have to support? Um, so we're told the density by giving, they give us that a volume of one centimeter cubed is a mass of 2.6 grams, okay? Let's turn this into kilograms over meters cubed. So there are, in one kilogram, there are a thousand grams. In um, one meter, there are a hundred centimeters, but we need to do this three times because we have cubed. Right, so what I get is I get um, 100 times 100 times 100 divided by 1,000 times 2.6. And so I get 2,600 kilograms per meter cubed is what I get for my density. So my mass is just my density times my volume. And I can see that if I multiply 2,600 times 12, 4, Six zero, I get three point. They say three five times ten to the ninth. Um, oh, they wanted the weight. So um, if I get this mass, and then if I take that mass and I multiply it by g, I get the weight. So they want the weight. So take that and multiply it by nine point eight, and I get three point one seven four. If I take three two three nine six zero 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 times 9.81, I get 3.17. I'm not sure what they used. Um, did I put in my numbers wrong? Oh, I'm sorry, I did. Um, the tunnel's 200 meters long with a height of seven meters. I put in H, um, I'm sorry, you guys. This shouldn't have been H, this should have been D. Um, I wasn't paying attention. So um, this would be D, and therefore this would have been um, 200 times the depth is 74 times the width is 8.9 is 131720. Multiply that by 2600 and multiply that by 9.81, and I get 3.356 uh, times 10 to the ninth, as they did, which was exactly what they found. Here's the hard part, though. Once you can find that, that's just understanding density. Once you can find that, though, we need to know how many columns, if the columns are um, exposed to half their ultimate strength. Now the ultimate strength, you can take that when delta L is equal to L, this will be equal to one, and you can ignore that. So in our equation, we get F over A, where this is ultimate strength, is E times delta L over L, but treat this as one. So the ultimate strength for each one will be E times A. Now we're told that these are steel. Um, and if you look up steel in your book, it has 400 times 10 to the six. So E for steel is 400 times 10 to the six Pascals, um, Newtons per meter cubed, okay? That is for steel. Our cross-sectional area, we're told, that these things each have a cross-sectional area of 798 
centimeters squared. I better double check that actually. Um, yeah. So if I want to turn this into, and did they mess that up? No, they didn't. They got that right. Um, if I want to turn this A into meters squared, remember there are 100 centimeters in one meter. And I have to square this to get rid of the centimeter squared, which is 7.98 or 7.98 times uh, 10 to the minus 4. We'll leave it at that. Okay, so knowing that, we can find the force of half this, right? So we want half this. And each one of them is going to be providing that. So how much force does each, the force per N has to be equal to um, one half EA, which is one half 400 times 10 to the six times 798. What are you doing? Mm. I don't know what this thing's doing. Times 798 times 10 to the minus 4. And that gives us 200 times 798 times 10 to the 10 squared, which is 1.6 times 10 to the 7th. Okay. So 1.6 times 10 to the seventh Newtons is how much force each one of the columns has to hold. So if we take the total weight, so we take the weight and we divide by force per Newton or per column, we can get the column, the number of columns. And so the number of columns is obviously, and why is my pen doing this? So the number of columns is this, right? Um, obviously. And so what we do is we go back to this weight that we found, this row B, this density times B, and divide it by 1.6 times 9.6 times 10 to the seventh. And this is 3.3556. Times 10 to the ninth. And so we see that we get 3.35 divided by 1.6, and we multiply by 10 squared, which is, I get 210. Um, they get 211. I don't know which one's right. I don't know if it'll count that wrong. Um, I probably should have included one more uh, for the remainder, is maybe what they did. Um, but anyway, so yeah, that's what you need to understand. This problem is a little bit weird because you're finding the ultimate strength. And I'm not sure that's 100% the legitimate way to do it. But um, yeah, it's, it's just a, it's really a, a problem about density and cross-sectional area. All right. So our final one, and this is a little bit more useful for elasticity, is we have this wood block, and we're actually going to have to use torque and elasticity to understand this. But before we begin, we know that at the center of this thing, it has a weight. And that weight is M times whatever the theme is times G. And there's a wire A and a wire B, which have tensions. This guy is R of A, or I guess I'll call it D of A since they do. This guy is D A away, and this guy is D B away. Now let's just look at the torques. If we took this thing to be in equilibrium about here, we know we would have a torque D A and tension A. And this would be positive. 
And we know that we'd have a DB and a tension B and that this would be negative. I'm sorry, I flipped those. It doesn't really matter, but I flipped them. Um, what? Okay, fine. I don't know what my... Um, seems like my pen is acting weird. So this is negative. If I do tension B, this one positive, but I set this thing is an equilibrium. So I get DB, TB minus DA, TA. And if I set them equal to each other, I can get the ratio, which is what they're gonna ask me for of DA over DB. So DA, TA is DB, TB. And DA over DB is the tension of A over the tension of B, okay? Secondly, I have this equation for the forces in the Y. There's no X forces. The sum of the forces in the Y are zero, and that's TA plus TB minus MBG, okay? Whatever the mass of this block is. Now, um, the log, I guess. Now we're told, right, that there was a force acting on A that caused it to lengthen. And so let's see if we can figure out what that was. So we know that the elasticity is equal to E change of length over L. If we read this problem right correctly, we want to find F of A. So we want A times E times delta L over L. Now, A, E, delta L, and L are. So the first thing they ask us, what are the forces on A and B and what is that ratio? So the area of A, if it has a radius that's given, the area is pi R squared. It's the cross-sectional area that this force is being applied to. So this would be pi r squared. R is, we're told, is 1.05 millimeters. So this is 0 0.00105 squared. E, Young's modulus is given as two times 10 to the 11 Newton meters squared or Pascals. Um, we're told that originally wire A Initially, it was 2.2 meters long and 1.9 millimeters shorter than wire B, okay? So if initially this was 2.2 meters and it stretched 0 0.0019 meters, we can now find the force of A by multiplying all those numbers. So let's do that. So pi times 0 0.00105 times 0 0.00105 times Young's modulus, which is two, I'll handle the 10 to the 11th in a minute, times the change is 0 0.0019. So I get 1.316 times 10 to the minus eight. If I multiply that by 10 to the 11th, I get 1.31617 times 10 to the third divided by the length of 2.2. So divide by 2.2, I get 5.9833 times 10 to the um, third. So what have I got wrong here? Um, so if my area, my F of A, <laughs> hmm. F of A times L A, oh, they're the same length. Um, hmm. No, they're not the same length. Um, so what they've done here is L for E. Oh. 
Oh, I see what I've forgotten. And I'm sorry that I've forgotten that. So I've got this a little bit weird and I'm sorry for that. Um, what they're saying is that not only did the first wire stretch, the second wire stretch this way. So I forgot that, I'm sorry. So the change in length of A plus the change in length of B, right? No. Um, the change in length of A is going to be equal to the change of length in B of wire B plus the small L that it changed, right? Because initially they're both going to change by some length, plus it has to get L. So there's some change of length of L and there's some change of length of LB. And setting this to find the force of L. So as I said, F of is A times E over delta L over L. And we want to know what it is for A, and we want to know what it is for B. They have the same area. Okay, so their area is pi r squared, where r is 0 0.00105 squared. Okay, and let's solve this for delta LA. So FA um, times delta LA, nope, times LA. Um, is equal to, so what I did was I solved it for delta LA over LB over E plus this little length change. And I wanna solve this for FA. So if I wanna solve it for FA, I get that FA is equal to a times E over L A times F B times L B times A over E plus this little change. That is my force. Do I know everything here? No, I don't. Um, so how am I supposed to find the force on B? Um, Oh, yeah, I'm being dumb. So the other thing that we have to use here is FA plus FB have to be, have to be equal to zero. And we're given the mass of the block. Um, we're given that this is 140 kilograms. So we can find FB is equal to MG minus FA. And if I plug that in, this is a big pain, but FA, I'm gonna put this back as LA over A times E is equal to FB, LB, AE plus a little L. So this is FA, LA, A over E is equal to MG minus FA times LB over AE plus a little L. If I move this over, what I get is FA is LA over AE minus LB over AE is equal to MG LB over AE plus L. And solving this whole thing for FA, I then get 
uh, MGLB over AE plus little L, all divided by LA minus LB all over AE, right? And I can make this a little bit cleaner by dividing through by AE, or I mean multiplying top and bottom by AE. Um, so let's do that. FA is MGLB plus LAE all over LA minus LB. Now we know that the original lengths of A and B were. Um, this was 2.2 meters. And so this was 2.2. 1019 meters. Um, we know the change was 0 0.0019. We know um, E is 2 times 10 to the 11th. We know A is pi times 0 0.00105 squared. Um, and we know the mass is 140 kilograms, and we know G is 9.8. So let's put all this in. Um, 140 times 9.8 times 2.2019 plus 0.0019 times pi times 0.00105 times 0.00105 um, times 2000012345678910. I get 437 or 433, uh, 4337. Dividing that by the length of A minus the length of B, right? Is that going to be okay? Because that's going to give me a negative number. Um, have I done something weird here? So this is MGLB plus AELA. Oh, they should be plus. Where did my plus go? Oh, because it's not a minus here, it's a plus. Um, sorry, it's a plus. Plus, and that means um, I know my length um, was 2.20 plus 2.2019. And I get 985. They get 984.8. So that is FA. And that is the hard part, the easy part now. Stop doing that. The easy part now is that because we have FA plus FB minus MG is equal to zero, the sum of the forces in the Y, we can find FB is MG minus FA, and MG is 140 times 9.8, the mass of the log, minus this uh, 984 that we just found. So 140 times 9.8 minus 984 is 388, 387.1. So they get 387 Newtons. And then last, we already found this, but DA over DB is FB over FA. And so that's just um, 387 divided by 984 is 0.39. And that's it. From there, we're done. Sorry, that problem was a mess. I completely forgot when I looked at it that you had to remember that they were going to stretch. Both of them would stretch as well as just A stretching. I don't know why I always forget that. Um, but yeah, you can see that this stuff um, can get really hard and annoying with the elasticity. It's why I don't generally want you to do more than use the equation to plug in some numbers. Um, 
This is about as hard as it gets for elasticity. Anyway, uh, we'll talk about more problems tomorrow. Talk to you later.